agency's assessment of fair housing, uh, affirmatively furthering in fair housing. Um, we're going to get a report and uh, approve the assessment of fair housing work plan. This is the plan of work, not the plan of results. Brian That's Darby. correct. This is the, the plan for the plan. And uh, both Liz Darby and I are pleased to be here this morning to seek your uh, endorsement to formally launch the county's new fair housing assessment as Liz will explain to you momentarily this is rooted in the Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968 as well as a uh, being a requirement for the county's participation in the federal grants program as well as the housing authorities and cities and towns in Marin uh, the Obama administration adopted some new guidelines for fair housing ass assessments last year that um, place a greater emphasis in a couple of areas at least. One is uh, recognizing that where people live has a tremendous influence on the quality of their lives. And so uh, as perhaps compared to the analysis of impediments to fair housing, which is will eventually become the, um, uh, the precursor to the work we're doing now, um, the new fair housing assessment will um, really address a uh, more focused and more focused way uh, assets, community assets such as access and equal opportunity to health care, transportation, healthy foods, uh, and other things. The other area where I think you'll see a change as compared to the analysis of impediments is that the new fair housing guidelines that uh, provide some framework for the work we're about to do um, will provide more responsibility to local governments to identify actions and policies and programs that will reduce segregation in their communities and um, create more inclusiveness in their communities. And so with that as an introduction, I'll turn it over to Liz Darby, who has a, a very good overview of the work in terms of what, when, and how. So Liz. Thank you, Brian. Good morning, supervisors. I'm Liz Darby with the Community Development Agency. And this morning, I'd like to provide an overview of the proposed work plan for the assessment of fair housing and a little history of why we have a need for this work. The, um, uh, the first thing I'll do is start with an overview. We'll talk a little bit about fair housing laws, about uh, a review of the funding the county currently receives from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Then I'll give a brief overview and update of the analysis of impediments to fair housing choice, followed with an outline for the proposed work plan for the assessment in fair housing. Fair housing laws are civil rights laws. And Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968 prohibits discrimination in the sale, rental, and financing of housing and housing-related transactions based on race, color, national origin, religion, sex, disability, marital status, and familial status. Also, fair housing laws require that we affirmatively further fair housing. And what that means is taking meaningful steps that address significant disparities in housing needs and in access to opportunities, including access to education, employment, transportation, poverty exposure, and environmentally healthy neighborhoods. It also means that we need to replace segregated living patterns with truly integrated and balanced living patterns. We also must consider transforming racially and ethnically concentrated areas of poverty into areas of opportunity, and we must foster and maintain compliance with all civil rights laws and fair housing laws. Marin County receives funding from the housing, a Department of Housing and Urban Development for low income and moderate income communities with uh, grants in the Community Development Agency, which oversees home investment partnership funds and our CDBG Community Development Block Grants funds. Health and Human Services receives funding for their continuum of care, and the Housing Authority receives funding for their Section 8 Housing Voucher Cho Choice Program. With our home investment partnership funds, the county has supported the development, maintenance, and preservation of affordable housing through communities and organizations, including the Bolinas Community Land Trust, Homeward Bound, Buckaloo, and the Marin Center for Independent Living. Under our CDBG funds, the county has supported services for children, seniors, the disabled, and our underserved communities, including funding for the Family Law and Legal Services, Senior Access, 
uh, Marin City Health and Wellness Center, Fair Housing of Marin, Community Action Marin, and several others. In 2011, HUD conducted a comprehensive review of our county's policies, practices, and procedures that affected fair housing choice for people in our county. That included overseeing our laws, our regulations, our administrative practices, policies, and procedures. And in October of 2011, the Board of Supervisors approved an implementation plan that identified 29 specific recommendations to address barriers to fair housing. From 2011 to 2016, the Board of Supervisors and staff developed strategies and action plans to address these recommendations. And the following are some of the outcomes. The Board of Supervisors allocated a million dollars to support the creation of affordable family housing in the county and allocated $450,000 to support landlord incentives aimed at expanding participation in the Housing Authority's Section 8 voucher program. And as we continue to expand our work to affirmatively further fair housing, the Priority Setting Committee, which oversees the implementation plan, was expanded to include members of the community and of the protected classes. The county hired a fair housing program specialist, and all CDBD and home applicants are now required to show how their projects affirmatively further fair housing choice. In 2015 and 2016, the Board of Supervisors used county housing trust funds to acquire two family complexes, one in Forest Knolls and one in Fairfax, and CDBG home funding and uh, home funding were used for affordable housing for individuals with disabilities and for new family housing. Internally, the county established the equity team comprised of the Community Development Agency, Health and Human Services, the library, the probation department, parks, the CAO's office, and others um, to ensure that all citizens and employees of the county have access to opportunities to reach their full potential. Affinity groups for African Americans, <coughs> Asians, Latinos, and our LGBT employees have been created to support each other and share with and inform other employees who support those communities. And most recently, the county committed to its goal of achieving racial equity by participating in the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, equity with the goal of creating an action plan that develops policies and procedures to advance racial equity throughout the county. In 2015, 2015, HUD replaced the analysis of impediments to fair housing choice with the current assessment of fair housing. And this change requires recipients of HUD funds to evaluate our current fair housing issues, including any barriers to fair housing choice, to identify contributing factors that account for those issues, to establish goals and priorities, and to document our assessment process. The goals for the assessment are to identify significant actions to overcome patterns of segregation, develop strategies that achieve truly balanced and integrated living uh, patterns, to educate and promote fair housing choice policies, and to foster inclusive communities that are free from discrimination. The proposed work plan for the assessment of fair housing will include discussions of fair housing issues from a wide range of voices from all parts of the county. They will establish goals and outcomes that address disparities in housing needs and access to opportunities. It will provide a strategic and ongoing oversight by an advisory group, and it will have significant community education, engagement, and input in addressing barriers to fair housing choice. The key fair housing issues that we will explore will include patterns of segregation and integration and disproportionate housing needs in ethnically concentrated areas, an analysis of publicly supported housing, including admission policies, community support for housing development, and a review of the Section 8 voucher program, a disability and access analysis to analyze policies and practices in housing, services, and programs that affect our disabled communities, and an evaluation of disparities in access in housing, schools, transportation, employment, healthy neighborhoods, and open space. During the next 18 months, our goal will be to identify those barriers and, contri and contributing factors to fair housing choice and disparities in access to opportunities. 
We'll develop strategies and recommendations to the board on ways to address and overcome those barriers. We'll engage community voices that have previously not participated in countywide initiatives, including youth groups and young adults. We'll engage county employees, affinity groups, social equity teams in the fair housing discussions. We'll develop a communication strategy that is both transparent and inclusive. We'll involve youth groups and young adults in fair housing related discussions and we'll align CDBG and home funding with AFH goals. The CDA director will convene a, tw a 12 to 14 member advisory group which will include members of the protected classes, nonprofit and community organizations, elected officials, fair housing of Marin representatives, a representative from Marin Housing Authority and a representative from our current priority setting committee. Our goals will be to analyze the HUD provided data and our local data, identify barriers and contributing factors for each of the topics I identified, hear, understand and really receive input from community groups and organizations and ultimately to make recommendations to the Board of Supervisors for an implementation plan. And lastly, our community engagement process will be an extensive outreach process that will include discussions related to housing issues and will include an educational component of fair housing laws and rights. Individuals and groups that will be encouraged to participate will include emerging leaders from our local high schools, community colleges and universities, our community youth le uh, leadership groups, from nonprofit um, agencies representing members of the protected classes, from faith-based faith groups and organizations, the business community, county employees, affinity groups and social equity teams. And that concludes my presentation on the work plan for the assessment of fair housing. Thank you for your time and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I'll take comments uh, from comments. our board uh, or, or questions from the board. We'll come back to after public comment, but Supervisor Owen, did you want to raise any points? Um, yes, I'd like to. Thank you very much. This work plan uh, is a continuation of work that our board began in 2011 when the county agreed to do an analysis of impediments that we saw to fair housing. Understanding what fair housing means is not all that easy. It does not necessarily mean affordable housing, although a lack of it may be identified as one barrier to fair housing, but there are other issues. Fair housing really is about giving people protected under the civil rights law the opportunity to fulfill their choice of where they want to live. As this staff report adeptly states, the county is required to take meaningful actions that combat discrimination, overcome patterns of segregation, and foster inclusive communities free from <coughs> barriers that restrict access to opportunities for the protected classes. Cities and towns that benefit from federal grants are expected to contribute to these efforts. I support this work plan, not just because it is the right thing to do, but because if we don't do the right thing, the consequences of not doing this has the potential of causing great harm to our county and our cities. Let's look at Westchester County, who in essence told HUD to keep their grant money rather than look seriously at their problems, and has, as a result of that, has had to give HUD $68 million to provide multifamily housing in the whiter, wealthier, wealthier areas of Westchester. Or Baltimore, who is providing $30 million for the same reason, and Yonkers, whose city council was charged $100,000 a day by the courts for, for, uh, to, until they prepared and built new housing in white neighborhoods. So I ask all of us, our board and those listening and the public, to support this work that is beginning right now, especially as many of us are grappling these days with how to bring more peace to our communities and how we can do the right thing, not just to satisfy HUD, but to quiet our own souls, always with the realization of the consequences that shadow all we do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other supervisors at this point? I have a quick question. Please, supervisor. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Um, 
Question, how does, how do we involve the cities and towns or what does that participation look like? Did you want to answer, Brian? Well, yeah, I'll start and then uh, Liz can add on. I think as Supervisor Arnold is aware, we've been engaging city and town officials through the county's priority setting committee, which is, as you may know, is uh, a body, an uh, interjurisdictional body of elected officials recently expanded to include members of the protected classes who advise your board ultimately on the expenditure of federal grants housing. Uh, we're fortunate to have that group because it does include uh, an elected official from each of the jurisdictions that is a participant in the federal grants, uh, CDBG and home funding programs. We can also engage cities and towns through uh, individual meetings with staff and presentations to their city and town councils. And just to follow up with that, similar to all the other individuals and groups that will be meeting with the cities and towns will also be engaged in the same way. They'll be presented with the same information. We'll be asking for their feedback and input. There are going to be a couple of opportunities for us to bring those groups together to talk about specific items and, again, engage them more ongoingly than we have in the past. And then um, just a, a quick comment and a, a thank you for including in the staff report um, the historical, um, the, the reference to the historical policies that go back, way back, um, the 50s or 60s, I can't remember when, around lending programs here in, in Marin County, and I expect um, the same kind of federal, ho federal home loan um, or uh, loan programs were, were, were being um, offered elsewhere in the country that left um, African Americans out of uh, the running for, um, sub for, for home loans. And um, anyway, I think it's something that if, um, it would be a great place for the IJ to focus its attention on this historical story about policies that go back many, many decades that sort of set up um, the situation here in Marin that we have at least one contributing factor. So a question for you, and I, and I echo that. I think the background, the history was very, very important. So um, you've mentioned federal funding, and we certainly, I think, have spent the CDBG and home dollars wisely on a variety of really important causes. There's less and less of it to go around. And while I think this work is extremely important, it's obviously difficult to move forward in many ways without significant federal funding. So is there a, is there a pot of money on the horizon? Is there a silver lining to this incredible amount of work that's going to go into this work plan? By doing this work, as well as I know we will, will we be better situated to increase the amount of federal funding that may be able to come our direction to help us implement some of the goals that we already have that I'm sure will be fleshed out as part of this work plan? To a certain extent, that uh, is dependent upon Congress and perhaps oh, well. the <laughs> November election um, <laughs> more significantly. The amount of, of uh, grant funding that the county receives tends to fluctuate from year to year. I think, as you know, we've reported on that. Uh, this year, it, it actually went up uh, a little bit in one of the programs, which was encouraging. But um, uh, we'll be keeping our eye on, uh, on Congress and HUD, uh, both in San Francisco and Washington, to, to monitor that situation. You raise a very good point uh, in the sense that the um, the requirements on local governments to provide detail on how they spend their federal funding to address fair housing issues, reducing segregation, inclusive communities have expanded. And as I mentioned in my introductory comments, there are two or three areas where we've seen that occur or will be seeing that occur through the new federal uh, fair housing assessment guidelines. Um, that doesn't always translate into additional funding for staff administration. Um, I do want to acknowledge our county administrator, Matthew Heimel, in providing financial support to, um, to address the cost of this fair housing assessment. Right. I, think that's well, I, I think beyond that, we might, we might feel more uh, positive about the additional reporting requirements if we had more federal money across the board to actually accomplish some of the goals, not only to pay for the staff time that's involved in the additional reporting, but to actually makes, turn the, you know, really move the dial yeah. on some of these goals. So it, it is frustrating, and I know you don't have a magic fix for it. I just wanted to flag it as an ongoing challenge. Yeah. No, we, we appreciate that. Yeah. And if I could just add one thing. One of the goals that I may have mentioned was the CDBG and uh, home funds that we were going to do to align more with affirmatively further. We're also going to be using those funds to, uh, to leverage 
uh, support and participation in a lot of the nonprofits and the work that's being done so that and one of the, the examples that we're looking at is to change our dates of submission for the board's approval so that other nonprofits and other people that are applying for federal grants and other grants can use our funding to leverage their opportunities That's to get more funding. Yeah. Also, isn't there money for marine, to marine housing, federal money to marine housing authority? Absolutely. That is threatened also. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and to open it up. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, uh, just a uh, quick comment and question. Um, as Supervisor Arnold noted, um, affordable housing is, is one aspect of the fair housing analysis, not the only one, but an important one. And Liz, I was very happy to see you emphasize a number of the steps we're taking to preserve affordability uh, in our housing stock. Obviously, we all recognize a huge uh, challenge in a, in a high cost, high rent. Uh, slow growth areas such as ourselves. Um, and on Section 8, for example, I know we are uh, being creative. We're coming up with landlord incentives. Um, uh, we're reaching out to HUD. Um, I, I feel there are several ways they can improve the program to, again, account for higher rent areas. I've spoken with them back in Washington, D.C. Um, I know other um, uh, county staff are, but what's your sense? I mean, is, is, is HUD and our decision makers taking notice of these, um, you know, putting aside the issue of a philosophy of, of you know, uh, building our way out of an issue, um, uh, these alternatives, are, are they being favorably received? So ac an acquisition strategy. Uh, uh, creative approach to Section 8, for example. Mm -hmm. Brian, do you want to talk or do you want me to talk? Well, based upon the discussions that we've had with the local HUD staff in the San Francisco office, I think the answer is yes, they have looked favorably upon the board's recent actions to place a greater emphasis on preserving affordability as well as to pursue new housing uh, and to support landlord incentives. Um, we'll learn more about that uh, in the coming weeks as we meet with HUD staff to discuss the status of the county's voluntary compliance agreement. But we're optimistic at this point that uh, local HUD staff and perhaps by extension staff in Washington, D.C. will give the county uh, credit for taking those steps. And if I could just follow up with that, part of the community engagement process will be to come up with those creative ideas, right? We at the county don't have all the answers, and that's why we'll be going out and talking to people. And, and HUD's very much aware that that is very much a part of this process. Great. I'll open it up to public comment. Good morning, Supervisor. I think the, day of, the word of the day is humility, so I will act in accordance with that. Uh, thank you, Judy, for your comments on that. And uh, just to quickly address Kate's issue of budgets, uh, the actual the original investigation from HUD came in 2009, and one of the several findings of inadequacy was that an analysis of the impediments to fair housing choice had not been done in 14 years, <coughs> even though it had been required to have been done every five years. So we have a little bit of catch up to do. So I think the budget on this is lean. Um, and I have an ask today of you five, which is that you put into practice already the policy and principles of engagement. Uh, there was very little notice of this being on the um, agenda today. I think many of the groups that Liz has reached out to would have liked to have commented uh, to you both in support as well as areas of improvements. And I would ask that you put off in your decision until your next meeting in two weeks. So I have a few comments to make about the presentation. Um, one is I'm glad to see an, uh, an emphasis on education. I think that's critical. Uh, I have a 
Coincidentally, last night, the Davenport Institute awarded San Rafael an award for civic engagement. I understand they have two contracts with the county. I also understand that they are an arm of Pepperdine University with whom I have very little in common. And I think the issue there is to what extent these contracts and the outcomes will be more populist than educational or outreach, especially to people of the protected classes, and whether or not it will be meaningful. I think one of the key decisions you have is whether or not the, the opportunity here to find out why 500 blacks moved out of Marin City over the last seven years is important, or whether or not the funding of Gates, which is a wide enclave in a black area, is the best use of your money. I think there is a second look to be had here. I think the work that Liz has done is exceptional. But I think the work plan is an important aspect, which was not looked at when the last AFI was done. There was no opportunity to engage in the work plan production. And I hope there will be this time. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I apologize about just stepping in at the last minute. I didn't hear the presentation, so I could even be out of context. But you know, a man without opinion is a man without value. What I would like to add from the little bit that I did here, I think the county has a much greater role that you could reduce the cost of housing, especially for those people that can't afford it, by changing your taxing structure. So in the Ross Valley, when you tax a 10 bedroom, 12 bathroom house, the same sewer fee, Ross Valley school bonds, Measure J and Mira, at the same rate as a seven by 10 foot apartment, you're asking the people like that can serve out necessity to subsidize a larger footprint. And for lack of a better word, it's really not fair. So the people that are really having the most difficult time, they could be assessed by their square footage or their municipal use. But instead, we're assessing them and putting them into a lump sum as a very large mansion that probably has greater resources. Thank you. Great, thank you. I just wanted to comment to, to Mr. Curry's uh, comments. I understand that it's, it's frustrating sometimes when you work hard on things and, and the word, or at least people don't come, but I don't think we can afford to wait and I would really urge our board to pass this work plan today. Um, we're on a time clock and I don't wanna see us waste even another week, but I will say that the cities and towns are going to become very aware of this as we go out because this is going to be a very inclusive uh, process. It needs to be, it has to be, and uh, so I'm, I'm not concerned about that. I n I'm glad the IJ's here today. I hope they do a story on this and I hope that this begins to get the word out. We're also video and they can webcast it. It's an important issue. It's very important. J not just because of the positive aspects, but because of the, of the hammer that hangs over us. Mm -hmm. uh, to that point, um, I, I too think we should go forward today. This is really about committing to the work program and to the budget needed. But I think to the speaker's point um, that I would invite and as chair would welcome uh, next week if any of the organized organizations that would like to share their reaction to or input with us uh, want to come, we'll make attention to that um, and make that available for them to do in an organized way. Um, this, is, this is a process, it's not a point in time decision. Um, and so I think that we, I think the point is well taken and I think that our outreach efforts can always look at, in, reflect on what we can do to engage more people. Um, and so that would be one opportunity. Um, I'm going to make a few comments and just say that um, this is an important responsibility that we have. Um, I feel uh, very well served by the report that you've presented and the work plan that you presented, Brian. I think uh, Liz Darby brings us uh, strong credibility, great working relationships, and a level of dedication to this issue that will serve us well. So thank you, Liz, um, as well. 
Um, one of the things that we've been learning as we as a county have been trying to really reflect on our role as a public agency in the history of institutional biases uh, towards certain populations. Um, I think that this, this is an ultimate reflection of where that needs to be and I, I like Supervisor Sears, I think showing the history uh, is important to realize that there have been decisions made historically that have been unfair and had much greater impact on certain communities than other communities. And if I were to say anything, it would be that, um, you know, starting with the 1940s is not really even the best place to start to understand this history of um, discrimination at our foundation of our nation. Um, recently, I've been reading the history of California Indians, Native Americans within California, who in the early 1800s reached a population of 300,000 and lived the sustainable lifestyle that so many of us uh, so casually describe as our aspiration. Uh, they truly lived in balance with the environment in which they lived. Uh, but over the course of 70 years, between the mission system and what it did and the disease it brought, the enslavement of the Native Americans under false pretenses to work on the California economy after the gold rush, um, the stealing of their children and putting them into slavery, uh, we broke the backs of an entire nation and ultimately gave no credibility to the fact that it was their land when Mexican and Spanish uh, inquisitions came in. And so it's not to go back and feel shame or guilt, it, but it is to recognize that, you know, the inhumanity and the lack of consideration do have profound effects on populations. And so what can we do today? What we can do today is to own that, to respect that, to, to look internally within ourselves at what we can do to overcome it. And I think the things that you're pointing out here about integrating our neighborhoods, ensuring that all people are welcome in all neighborhoods is an important step. Personally, and I think this is controversial, but personally I feel strongly that we need to find the right locations to increase our housing supply because we can't hit affordability if we just work with the existing housing stock. Uh, and so we have to figure out where that goes, what the character of those units should be and, and how they can be integrated into a community that we all feel so proud and care, uh, care for so deeply. And, you know, for me personally, I want to say with a smart train um, and Highway 101 with a major uh, bus corridor there, we really should be paying most attention in that corridor because that's really the climate change sustainable uh, location. So um, I just will have one last comment, which is to say that um, the fiscal staffing impact of a $229,000. Uh, Matthew, we are, this time around, we are doing most of this work in-house. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct, and we do have funds in the budget for this purpose. And, and is the position that Liz Darby is in, is that a, a limited-term position, which is why you talk about two years, or is that is that just taking our existing staff and assigning them to that to come up with that kind of a budget? Liz's position is a contract position for two years at so this point, and it can be extended. And that's what this reflects. Yes. Very good. Okay. Supervisor Kinsey, also the, the two-year time frame in the work program also is reflective of the deadline for all jurisdictions throughout the nation to complete these fair housing assessments by, I think it's 2019, correct? Right. Our goal is to complete it sometime in 2018, but that's also playing into the, the overall schedule. Two years. Yes. Okay. So uh, stay the course on the scheduled work plan. I think two years should be enough to get clear on what we need to do. Uh, with I'll that, move that you adopt the work plan. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.